The great tree of knowledge and wisdom had its roots in China, and wherever the benevolent shade of that wondrous and mighty tree fell, civilization flourished. Protected from the barbarian by a great wall to the north, over the centuries a culture developed that was the marvel of the world. Scholarship flourished, literature, medicine and military strategy were invented, then improved upon generation after generation. As the Egyptian, Etruscan and Roman empires rose and fell, the Chinese continued to develop a unique society that was decades, indeed centuries ahead of all others. Advanced agricultural methods allowed the toiling masses of peasants to feed the nation. Monuments of unparalleled beauty and complexity were constructed that would be copied throughout Asia. Buddhism was enthusiastically embraced by millions of Chinese. Medical concepts and techniques were developed that survive to this day. Physical conflict between individuals and vast armies was studied, researched and recorded. Individual centers of martial learning, notably the Shaolin Temple, existed and became the stuff of legends. We can assume that many such centers existed where young men were taught the art of self-defense. The achievements of the Chinese people were many. All contributed to the culture of the nation that for several millennia was unique. While the rest of the world slept the deep sleep of ignorance, China gloried in a civilization and in a way of life that would be unknown to others for many centuries. Then, after more than 5,000 years, burdened by the weight of its glory and exhausted by its many accomplishments, China began to die. Racked by civil commotion, foreign invasion and an overly bureaucratic governmental structure, the great but now decadent kingdom began to falter. As China declined, Japan was being slowly opened to foreign trade after centuries of seclusion. Britain had established a far-flung empire upon which the sun quite literally never set, while America still bled from a war that had robbed it of the flower of its manhood. Unlike the phoenix of Chinese mythology that was destroyed only to rise from its own ashes, there would be no miracle to save the Middle Kingdom. The seeds from the last blooming of the once glorious flower of Chinese culture would be scattered far and wide. Some fell on native soil, struggled to survive, but died. Others were taken to less civilized but younger and more vigorous cultures by foreign students and traders. Here they would grow strong and robust once more in the virgin soil of these distant lands. There were many visitors from overseas who aspired to learn the unique, unarmed fighting methods of China, but few were qualified. Even fewer were capable of withstanding the rigorous and lengthy training that turned bodies of fragile bone and vulnerable flesh into sculptured stone and tempered steel. Yet there were visitors to China, like the Okinawan Kanro Higaona, who willingly paid the heavy price of acquiring superhuman strength and physical invincibility. For 14 years, he paid in hardship, pain and suffering the cost of the passage from defenseless youth to master of the martial arts. When he left China in 1882 for his homeland of Okinawa, he took with him Sanchin and the other eight kata that were fundamental to this fighting system, as well as the techniques and training methods of his chosen art. He would become a legend in his homeland and the pillar of the Nahate method of unarmed combat that took its name from the city of Naha in southern Okinawa. To the art of which he became the chief exponent, he would add to in his maturity, as would his most capable student, Cho Jung Miyagi, in whose care this most aggressive and destructive fighting art was placed on the death of the master. It was he who refined it into a balanced and physical mental discipline, part hard and part soft, from which came the name hard soft school of China hand, Goju Liu Karate. Yeah! <laughs> 
The Okinawans who inherited the art of Kanri Ohigaona were a sturdy people, much used to hardship. For them, the severe training was a challenge more than an ordeal. Te, and later Karate, as it became known, was for people used to fighting a harsh environment very invigorating and produced a hardiness of spirit and a physical resilience that assisted them greatly in their day-to-day -day work as farmers and fishermen. The Okinawans brought a native energy and sincerity to all they did, and as a result, karate prospered greatly. It flourished to such an extent that, barely a century later, the knowledge that was so secretly transmitted from a Chinese master to his Okinawan student became the intellectual property of the world. An art that has become the activity of choice for many millions of people of every nationality, race and creed, but one that remains to this day, in some respects, as secret and as shielded from the public gaze as it was centuries ago. Morio Higaona is a member of Karate's Inner Circle, one of the most qualified and respected teachers in the world. He is the heir to the legacy of Chojo Miyagi by virtue of being the premier student of Miyagi's last and most favored disciple. Renowned for the quality of his technique, his immense knowledge and his awesome power, no one is better qualified to present what makes Goju-do Karate unique and what makes his exponents feel in combat, sporting or otherwise. In the early 20s, with the help of a number of medical professionals, Chojun Miyagi-sensei, the founder of Goju-ryu Karate, developed a complete set of warming-up exercises that were unique both in their application and concept. Until this time, warming up was a rather random affair, if done at all, and injuries were frequent when severe training was undertaken. In order to make karate available to the masses, it was necessary to adopt an organized approach to training, and this Chojun Miyagi did quite brilliantly. The exercises he developed not only prepared the body for stress and allowed it to function safely while under duress, but actually contributed to the correct performance of both the techniques and the kata. Thus, the student is not simply preparing himself for strenuous exercises, but preconditioning and programming his mind and body. The muscle tone and agility acquired in this fashion contributes very significantly to the performance of the cutter and makes those disciplines very much easier to acquire. Before the heavy training that is typical of Goju-ryu style karate, approximately 45 minutes of basic exercises or yubiundo are carried out. These are comprehensive and vigorously performed with the breathing linked perfectly to the movements of the body.
The practical nature of many of the movements is obvious. For example, stretching with coordinated breathing like an animal awakening from a deep sleep. Swinging the arms to strengthen them and make them into weapons. Hands and fingers stretching as the whole body is prepared. The shoulder is pushed down as the neck is stretched. An exercise in which the concentration required to perform it is almost as important as the exercise itself. Two people can assist each other in training greatly. While one keeps his body stiff and falls against his partner, the other, keeping his body tight, catches him. はい。
切れ替わりはいはい。And the body strengthened by resistance training in this interesting and demanding combination. Stretching should be gradual and progressive, not jerky. The legs are moved against the partners to develop the muscles in the calf and the back of the upper leg to develop a strong snapping action which gives power to kicks. To safely stretch the side hip joint and leg, the body is stretched slowly and held for 20 to 30 seconds at the limit. This exercise is not for beginners, and even with experienced students, caution must be used. Stretch twice to the limit and hold for 20 to 30 seconds.
Clearly, this stretch has to be done slowly and carefully, then held for 20 to 30 seconds on completion. Pressure is carefully applied by the instructor to the student's body in order to stretch it to the point of utmost flexibility. The soles of the feet are pushed together and the instructor carefully applies his weight to stretch the student's body. Resistance training against the instructor does not use the body weight, but the muscles of the elbow and shoulders, as well as the lateral muscles. This is a snap kicking on exhalation eye development exercise.
メイツ聞いてないな。はい。はい。Another example of very beneficial training with a partner. Sit ups combined with punching techniques. A novel but practical way of developing powerful leg muscles, followed by a way of stretching and relaxing the back muscles to conclude Jumbiundo. In the words of the founder of Go Judo Karate, supplementary exercises, Hojo Undo, are practiced with the aim of perfecting the kata. The purpose of these exercises is not only to develop strength and power in the body as a whole, but to develop each part of the body individually in order to develop complete body power. Undoubtedly, they are responsible in part for the immense strength of Go Judo Karate exponents. The explosive power they can unleash and the hardness that they develop. Attributes that allow them with impunity to submit, if necessary, to the assault of an opponent in order to decimate him at close quarters with a flurry of powerful kicks and punches. Or a punitive grasping technique followed by a throw and control hold. Many of the training methods and equipment that are unique to Go Judo Karate were brought back to Fukien Prefecture in southern China by Kan Yohigaona. They are effective, safe, and useful for students of any style of karate and rapidly build a strong body, powerful legs, and a phenomenally strong grip. Training stones of varying weights are manipulated with both hands to develop the strength of the wrists. So that they will withstand the shock of a powerful punch being delivered.
Thrusting with the training weights develops power and also teaches control. The heavy weight so forcefully pushed forward must also be brought to a controlled halt with the muscles acting upon it. The grip is strengthened and the blocking action developed by rotating the forearm against the shaft of the training weight. Repetitive raising and lowering actions with the training stone lead to formidable wrist and forearm development. As does shifting the weight of the training stone back and forth. Nigirigami, literally gripping pot or jar, is another unusual training item much favoured by go judo exponents. With the stomach, body and legs tensed and the feet rooted to the floor, the performer regulates his breathing and settles his power into the centre of his body. The heavy jars, which can be made heavier by the addition of sand or water, are gripped with the tips of the fingers, raised and grip tightly as the karate exponent moves in the typical go judo stance. The ceramic training jars clearly had their origins in China, although now iron weights with a raised grip to accommodate the fingers are used there. Apparently, so many ceramic jars are broken by students that the iron substitutes were adopted for reasons of economy. The grip that is developed through training with the heavy ceramic jars is phenomenal and can be used to great effect in a real fight to both deter and severely damage an opponent at close range. Attacks to the side, ribs, face and legs are both common and extremely effective. Chojo Miyagi Sensei was renowned for his ability to tear raw meat into strips with his bare fingers before placing it into the frying pan. Anyone who has experienced the grip of a Goju master will testify to its ability to deter even the hardiest opponent and cause extreme pain as well as, if necessary, extensive damage. Another weapon in the Goju arsenal that is developed by intelligent and systematic training. Yes. 
side. Then fingertips. Then thumb. Then this glove. And two finger glove. Other way. Thumb. And twist. And grabbing. And grabbing. Even the feet, toughened by regular training, can be used as weapons of assault. Chojo Miyagi brought back this unique training implement from Hawaii when he returned from an extended period of teaching there. Weighing about 70 pounds, it is both heavy and awkward to manipulate and therefore quickly develops both strength and control. Its uses are endless. It can be used like a medicine ball. to strengthen the legs with squats. Enhance the effect of push ups. And to develop explosive power. It is also used to develop the twisting power that is necessary for the successful completion of throwing techniques. specific technique is performed while the weight is taken on the shoulders. Reactions and strength can be improved by throwing and dodging the heavy training aid. The Congo Ken also has a role in body conditioning where it is used to simulate a body check.
The Ishii Sashi weights are used to develop strong shoulders, wrist, and therefore a strong grip. Used on the feet, they build up the ankle, knee, leg and lower stomach area. Using the same breathing as in Sanchin Kata, the whole body is tensed at the moment of focus. Being a pragmatic form of self-defense, Goju Ryu Karate promotes body conditioning to allow students to experience the repeated shocks of an actual combat while at the same time hardening their bodies and strengthening their minds. Ude Tanren conditioning makes the arms strong and forges them into effective weapons for blocking and striking. The key to successful training is regular and serious practice. By this means, both the whole person is developed and the level of both mental and physical health and strength achieved that is the envy of many contemporary professional athletes.
Some of the most powerful and therefore effective karate techniques must be endured if they are not to bring a speedy end to every clash of combatants. Resistance to the shock and pain are built up systematically by exercises such as these. Realistic but controlled clashes between trainees develop skill and endurance as well as the familiarity with close encounters fighting and therefore a highly developed sense of correct timing and distance. Conditioning is important as it makes parts of the body into strong weapons to be used against an opponent when fighting in earnest. It also makes them largely invulnerable to damage in combat. Advanced practitioners spend many hours strengthening and hardening each striking area of their body. Strength and confidence are built by these exercises. The more realistic the clash, the less unsettling the shock of actual combat. Bolstered by superior fitness, great endurance and a strong mental attitude, the warrior thus trained will invariably prevail. The fundamental precept of Goju Do Karate is that in an encounter it is probable that one will be hit by an opponent before that encounter is over. Conditioning is designed to gradually accustom the student to this sort of shock so that he will continue to function effectively when it does occur.
Striking the makiwara to condition the hands and feet and strengthen the body is unique to the practice of karate and is taken very seriously by high-level exponents. Punching ball training conditions not only the extremities of the body that actually make contact with the opponent, but the supporting structure as well. Repetitive striking builds up the wrist and forearm, shoulder, back and hips, as well as the supporting leg. Makiwara training must be both regular and repetitive. A beginner would do well to start with 100 punches each side per day, building up to 30 minutes training each day, and more. As training progresses, as many as 1,000 strikes on each side can be performed during the course of one training session. Some students may prefer to train more with their weak hand until they feel as comfortable punching with the left as with the right. The makiwara should be adjusted to just below shoulder level and strikes must be performed on exhalation as they would be in actual combat. Thus, as with all training in Goju Liu, not only are the physical movements learned, but also the breathing and correct concentration and focus are perfected through continuous training. The importance of makiwara training cannot be overemphasized. All three of the fathers of modern karate believed in its use and trained regularly. Choju Miyagi had his students bury the boards in the hard ground of his garden dojo where they would train. Kenwa Mabuni, the founder of Shitoryu Karate, would punch the training board for hours in the pouring rain while his devoted wife held an umbrella over him. Funakoshi Gichin, the inspiration of the modern Shotokan form of karate, used the makiwara as an adjunct to his own training. The large makiwara teaches a different range of skills. The body and hands are strengthened, and an ideal target provided for backhand and open hand striking techniques. Power is concentrated in the first two knuckles of the fist, which may be gyrated at the moment of impact to create the greatest force. Many old karate teachers believed that striking with the third and fourth knuckles was dangerous, as Chinese medicine documents are linked between this area and the heart. The addition of wooden stakes allows for arm conditioning and blocking practice. Hey! Yeah. 
Static training is very important in the development of power and flexibility. However, when a certain level of proficiency is reached, speed, focus, stamina, and the ability to combine techniques smoothly and effectively becomes of premier importance. For this, the punching pads are used by the instructor to help his student fight effectively and for an extended period while breathing correctly, applying hip twists to the kicking techniques and showing good coordination. The large punching pad is used as much for stamina training as for the development of technique. The student is encouraged to attack vigorously using full power and as many combinations as he can manage until only spirit and determination drive him on. In the Orient, it is widely believed that as iron becomes steel by being subjected to intense heat and repeated blows, so the fighting man becomes stronger the more he is mentally and physically stressed. This process of spirit forging is an underlying principle of karate training in traditional schools and is supremely important. When Kan Yohigaona returned from southern China, he brought with him much of what we know as the Gojuru system of karate today. Indeed, were he to see what we have presented here, there is little doubt that he would recognize it immediately and, hopefully, approve. Such was the respect his students and others that followed him had for his achievements. They changed very little of what he taught. However, while the Kata Sanchin still fulfills its original function of power development and body strengthening. It varies slightly from the original version in that the hands are now made into fists instead of open in the knife hand position as was originally practiced in China. This kata is the bedrock of the Goju-ryu system. It develops both the physical and mental faculties of the student as well as the ability to concentrate effort intensely to a point where, even in the heat of conflict, he is unwavering. The body is held tight and the breathing is carefully regulated so it is impossible for an opponent to ascertain the exact moment of exhalation and therefore of weakness. The strength and stability of the student is tested by strikes to the key parts of the body where concentration must, by necessity, be the greatest. What an opponent sees when he looks at a Goju-ryu exponent is a powerful presence, determined 
and capable of inflicting a massive amount of damage if provoked. The body seems to be, as Miyagi Chojun would say, like a correctly inflated ball, neither too hard nor too soft, but easily capable of repulsing the strongest blow without suffering damage. It naturally follows that the student who can withstand strong and concentrated blows will have little to fear in actual combat. Performance of the other Go Judo Kata teach correct body movement and execution of technique. They must be performed correctly and with power while the performer imagines himself in actual combat. Each exercise has a specific inner meaning that often only the performer is aware of. They are not dances or mimes, but exercises in combat reality that have developed over aeons of time from successful engagements. Each is unique. Each is a cultural treasure. And each, more importantly, can turn an undisciplined student into a devastating fighter. Yet modern karate understands little of this. And kata is often reduced to little more than a performance to score points, just as a dancer or ice skater would. The movements of the cutter come to us from antiquity. They have meaning and substance and should not be reduced to a form of entertainment. They are the legacy of all modern karate students and should not, like any bequest, be frittered away. The conversion of cutter from training for combat to a performance art, as in modern karate, has led to a lack of understanding of both the obvious and secret meanings of many of the movements. Generally referred to as bunkai or applications, these are the most essential elements that have been lost to all but the most traditional styles of karate.
The Aksaku Kumite, or pre-arranged sparring, is an attempt to teach real fighting in a controlled environment. Care must be exercised, but this practice is useful for distance and timing training. It also accustoms a student to be in the close proximity of an opponent. This involves a full-speed performance of a kata and is for the more advanced student. By this time, control and distance judgment should be developed to a point where the exercise can be performed powerfully yet safely. Goju Karate does not rely entirely upon punching and kicking methods, but retains effective throwing techniques. These allow the karate student to operate at close quarters. When necessary, an opponent can be seized and held immobile, or thrown down, and the engagement finished with a powerful blow. Pushing hands exercise is typical of many ancient and extant Chinese martial arts. The Go Jiu Liu version is very powerful and considered an exacting exercise for all but the most experienced. When a weakness is sensed in the opponent, the opportunity is seized and a technique applied. Experienced instructors can actually sense an opponent's intentions through direct contact with his body. Clearly, this could be a life-saving talent when fighting in subdued light 
or in a restricted space. The culmination of training is actual sparring with an opponent. Preliminary and fundamental exercises, conditioning, makiwara training and kata all lead the student along the path that culminates in an engagement with an opponent. The student's ability is tested to the limit. If his stamina fails him, the hours of training will be wasted. If his techniques are performed badly, his reserves of energy will be easily squandered. All weapons in the karate armory must be honed to the point of perfection before a contest in which one will win and one will lose should be considered.
From that fountain of wisdom that first saw the light of day in China so long ago, came a stream of knowledge that helped the weak defend themselves and the good to overcome evil. Through the work of pioneers like Kang no Higona, it spread to Okinawa where, becoming a river with three tributaries, characterized by Choju Miyagi, Kenwa Mabuni, and Funakoji Gichin, it crossed to Japan. The efforts of these pioneers, from whom all major styles of karate come to us, have borne fruit to the extent that karate is now a worldwide movement with members in almost every country. A triumph to be certain, but one that must be tempered and maintained by adherence to the traditions and principles of the art. Karate, by its very nature, is a solitary endeavor that demands in exchange for strength, good health and fighting ability, time and effort to satisfy the dream that Kang Yohigaona had of being transformed from a defenseless youth into a man of iron. It also requires of the fighting man who wishes to become invincible that which, like the concept of infinity, has no known limit, humility.